is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Dark, Season 3, Episode 8, The Paradise. In this episode, I, uh, (laughs) unsatisfied isn't even the word. I really, like, I think I hated this. I think I might just actually hate it. I don't, I don't know. Maybe y'all can talk me down. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Bert for not only commissioning this episode, but allowing me to move it up in my calendar um, onto a day when I don't normally record, just so that I could make sure to have the finale be close enough to the penultimate episode that I don't like forget everything in the meantime. So I am certain that there are going to be some people who feel, and I know Rashawn has already said this, but I anticipated it before she said it. There are going to be people who perhaps think that I disliked this finale due to the spread out nature of my viewing experience. And I'm going to counter that assertion with another assertion, which is perhaps things being spread out allows you to see more of the problems with them. So I definitely think in some ways my viewing experience suffered because I lost track of certain threads. But by the time we get to the finale, so many of the things that I was trying to keep track of didn't really feel like they mattered anymore. And so I could have been putting my energies and attention to better use, it feels to me. Now, There's a certain feeling to this episode that I think, you know, obviously, due to the way it ends, I think we're supposed to feel everybody got to escape this, like, terrible purgatory they were living in. Lives were deeply improved. And cycles of, you know, frustration, sometimes violence, certainly unhappiness, were ended. And that may be correct, but I don't buy that that just means the world's better. And I cannot believe some of the the choices that they make for the script conjuncted with what they're showing us in their editing of the episode. So... I'm going to have to go through this step by step. My urge is to just want to talk about everything off of the top. But so much of what I want to talk about is brought up bit by bit as we go along. And so I don't really like, I don't feel like I could talk about it without having to constantly interrupt myself and refer back to the episode. So we start off once again watching Mikkel slash Michael kill himself. And then we have Jonas waking up and it seems to be sort of a nightmare for him. Like it's, you know, it could be sort of unclear whether or not this is an actual dream or whether or not this is like, you know, a a feel like another timeline invading his dreams, whatever. But we cut right from there to Claudia and Adam So this is the first time when I started to be like, do the writers get what the show is? Because Adam sees her is dumbfounded and says, you should be dead. Adam, people can time travel. Do you remember that? Whether somebody is dead in your version of what's happened has no relevance on whether they're out there running around still. 
And you, of all people, are supposed to be the most aware of that. And this kind of thing happens a lot in this show. And it, it just feels like we'll establish a sort of rule or we'll have people who are almost feeling like they're omniscient. And then they have this blind spot that's like inexplicable. And they suddenly just don't have the fucking, you know, sense God gave them anymore about a world that they ostensibly are like a key player in. It's weird. So this is the first moment that I'm like, why is he acting surprised? Like, she could be from any part of the past. Like, we've seen this a million times. Why is he acting like this is some shocking thing? The reason why is because the script wants him to suddenly have this realization. But it doesn't make sense for him to have the realization here because she could have come from any other time. So as they continue to have their conversation, he like gets very excited over her promise that things can be changed after all. And like the whole, what I was saying last episode, I think that uh, maybe had I watched these like back to back in a binge, this would have gotten on my nerves a lot sooner than it did. And it finally has. But in this episode, it really feels like they've turned it up to 11. And so something that was mildly irritating by the last like two, three episodes, at this point, I am straight up over it. It's the first of all, the monologuing with this really vague, esoteric language that's like, it feels profound, but really, they're not saying anything. And in this moment, Claudia tells Adam, you never knew how the game was played. You want to destroy the knot, but every action you take continues its existence. Um, okay, but no, though, you, Claudia, have been actively going out there and ensuring that everybody does things the same way that they did in the original version that you saw. They're not just like inevitably on the same path. You and other people are inserting yourselves to ensure things happen the same way. Which is a weird, like, it It feels like the show wants to have it both ways. They want to act like some things are inevitable, and then they want to have us watch, like, how many things were orchestrated and, and you know, how many fingers were in the pie. And it's just, what, what it, you got to pick one. You can't just keep saying... It's all, it all just has to happen the way it's always happened, as if that's just the way it goes, but then suggest that it takes a great deal of effort and oversight to ensure that everything continues to happen because they need it to. Those aren't the same thing. Um, and what kills me in this scene with Claudia is that she's talking to him. She's telling him, you thought the world was black and white, light and and shadow. She's like admonishing him here. Okay. Now, look, Adam's a piece of shit. I'm not lying about who he is. But I feel that if we went back to season one, we would recall Claudia being the one to tell him that there are two sides, light and dark, and that he's going to be on the side of darkness or is on the side of darkness and she's on the side of light. This whole duality thing that now she's sort of mocking him for believing in, she's the one who planted that in his head in the first place. So, like, how dare you? What? Are you kidding me? We're just going to act like she's so wise here and sees things that he doesn't see, even though she was the one who, like, pushed him in every direction every time she needed him to? Like, um, so this is when she tells him that you need a third dimension, that it's not just the two. The uh, And then she goes on her massive monologue. The world that gave birth to this knot... That's the third one, where everything originates, where a single mistake was made. 
Now, it turns out to be, unsurprisingly, the birth of this time machine that Ten House is working on. And I sort of said in the previous episode that it seems as if the death of his son is really the catalyst for everything. So it's not very surprising to me that that winds up being the thing, that they have to go and stop his son from being killed in order to keep him from trying to make this. But we'll get back to that. So she says, like you, he lost someone. And like you, he tried to bring that person back from the dead. And we get to see him, you know, attempting this, uh, the turning on of this machine again. We've seen him do it before. I had thought that they were all the same, like, attempt, but watching it, I like, this time I realized, oh, no, we're watching multiple tries, and it hasn't always worked. Um, so this time, um, I don't, this is the one that also doesn't work, because we wind up eventually seeing the one that does, and that's when Jonas and, uh, and, Martha are like in the caves right underneath. But she, so she says, but there is a way to destroy the knot. Though uh, through preventing the origin world, the invention of travel through space and time in the first place. Which it's weird again to me that now that we know what's going on, like reminder we as viewers didn't know the deal with Ten House and his son and how instrumental that was in him creating this time machine. But I think I am supposed to be assuming here that Adam knows and that Mar that Eve knows. And if they do, how in the hell has this not occurred to them by now? This is not earth shattering insight. This is common sense. Somebody was hell bent on creating a time machine because they lost somebody who was deeply important to them. You try and prevent that from happening. And it, it just, it feels so like such an obvious conclusion to me that I have to assume the information about Ten House was somehow hidden from Adam and from Eve. But I don't really understand how that can be when they're this like mired in the time travel stuff of this world. How can the origin of the, of the machine itself be so hidden from them? It feels like a huge oversight to me that they're, they're both supposed to be like what in their seventies by this time. And this hasn't like they, this hasn't been attempted already. And make it make sense. So explain. So she like a lot continues on with her monologue here. And uh, this is like really the crux of so much that the, the way that she talks to him here and the things that she says. Um, so we have this, like she goes in, he goes into like the burnt out husk of where his lair used to be. And she follows him in and he's asking her whether this conversation between the two of them has happened before. And she says, no, that he has tried to break the knot infinite times, but this moment that they are experiencing and having right now is the first time that they have ever had this conversation. And Okay, look, the, it, what it comes down to for me is what I've been complaining about yet again. Why does he believe her? Why does anybody believe anybody on this show anymore? It's almost gotten to a point where characters don't even seem to have personalities because they don't take initiative based off of their own desires anymore. They're simply told what they should do by another character who was also told that this had to happen. It's like the only people who actually have a personality are the ones who like lay outside the knot 
and Claudia. And Claudia's personality is conniving. That's it. That's her, like, main trait. There is no reason why after everything that Adam has been through and seen and the way that Claudia has, like, been suspect to him so many times that he should just take her word for it on this. And then later, when she sends him with the little, like, time ball to go and get Jonas after the moment that Adam, reminder, Adam had shot Martha in front of Jonas's face. Adam comes back, tells Jonas, come with me. No, for real this time. I promise I'm not lying this time. I just need you to come with me and this will save the world and we'll fix it all. Tell me, give me any reason why Jonas would listen to Adam after Adam just shot Martha in the chest. Explain to me why he would go with him. Why he would believe that, no, but for real this time, was like enough of an explanation for him to get dragged into a whole other fucking timeline. Not even just a different time. Not only that, but so little gets explained. He basically like gives Jonas the bare bones of what he needs to do. And then Jonas goes and saves Martha from going off with Francesca and Magnus. And then Jonas barely tells her anything. At one point, he's like, we have to stop somebody from dying. And she says, what are you saying? Which is what Jonas said to Adam earlier this episode. What are you saying? Everybody just wants to be fucking told in words what's happening. And nobody is explaining anything. Similarly, Adam asks Claudia, how did you come across this information? Because what she, her assertion is, is that the timeline, the main timeline in her opinion, and that's key, is the one in which Ten House and his son are, there, there's that tragedy that motivates Ten House to make this time machine. And then Martha's universe and Jonas's universe split off due to the mistake of this time machine. And she calls both of their worlds tumors more than once. She decides that those are like the wrong worlds. And this main one is the right world. And as she's telling Adam this, She's explaining that the reason why these two other worlds exist is because the two of you can't let go of each other. You are so determined to try and like fix things and make things work between the two of you that all of your actions to try and fix it are what perpetuate the thing, which is a, 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 an interesting theory. I don't hate the principle of that idea, but it comes up a couple more times. This whole, you aren't able to let go of the thing that you want. And that's exactly how Jonas phrases it to Martha later. I would like us to pause and reflect upon the fact the only thing in from what I'm seeing, from my perspective, sitting over here, the only thing that Claudia is using as a metric for whether or not Ten House's world is the right world that should be preserved is that Regina lives. That, that feels like it comes up so often that I cannot put we're going to stop time travel from even being a thing at the top of her priorities list because it doesn't feel sincere. She wants Regina to live more than anything. And we have seen her say it and kill other versions of herself and put that ahead of all else. How can she lecture Jonas 
about how her, him and Martha are unwilling to let go of the thing that they want when it, she is like solely driven by trying to save her daughter. That's her whole thing. She is in just as much of a cycle in that way as they are. And I want to give the show credit and and believe that this is like them doing this on purpose, but it doesn't feel like that. It doesn't feel like there's any acknowledgement of that. And the whole thing with um <laughs> the the scene where Eve gives Martha the gun and Eve has to go in and shoot Jonas. We're watching that scene while Claudia is delivering this monologue, okay? She's in the midst of telling Jonas how the two of them can't let go of one another. When we cut to Martha shooting Jonas to death, (laughs) that seems like letting go to me. I don't know if that's just me, but when you're willing to sacrifice somebody that you love because you think that's going to fix things, that feels like you are putting the well-being of all ahead of what you want. That feels like the definition of it, in fact. Why Why is this being treated like... it? it I, I want to believe that the show is trying to point out what a liar Claudia is, but the tone of it is wrong. It doesn't feel like that's what they're doing. But the cut is so perfect to the moment where Martha shoots him while she's talking about their attachment to each other that it's comically wrong. They, they they obviously oppose one another, her claim and the actual events we see unfolding in front of us. So I do not understand what we're doing here. They are just contradicting themselves over and over again. And they want us to forget what Claudia's whole motivation is. They want us to believe somehow that now she's like this, like altruistic about it and that she just wants what's best for everyone. But then in her own dialogue, she repeatedly talks about how making sure that Regina lives is paramount. I'm so mad, you guys. I'm so pissed. It makes no fucking sense. I don't understand. Oh, my God. I'm so irritated. Okay. 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 I'm going to calm down. Then we have the scene where the origin who is this like trio comes in and they all hug Martha. Now I will freely admit for this, that the origin, and that's what I'm going to call the whole trio of them. What went on with them confuses me enough that I don't feel confident making any commentary about them beyond the fact that I don't really understand the point of them. It feels like they were just kind of like going in and out of timelines, wreaking havoc because they had grudges, but it didn't really feel like things were, I I don't know what it is that they were putting into motion because it felt like the focus in their scenes was always like the shock factor and not really about what they were getting done. And so I didn't really pay attention to a lot of what they were getting done. It was, I know that there was like the pushing of this guy to sign the papers to allow the nuclear power plant to happen. Like essentially a lot of what they were doing was ensuring that things went the way that they, quote, were supposed to go, unquote. But again, when there's this, like, there's, I mean, countless monologues in this show about how things just repeat themselves. To watch how mu- how many events that we saw are recontextualized as having been contrived to happen due to outside forces, the whole inevitability like rings completely hollow. This wasn't all the circumstances of time. This was at times Adam, at times Eve, but mostly Claudia, because Claudia was the contact for both of them. 
Claudia was the one who informed Jonas in the first place about so much of what was going on. Claudia was the one that was working with Eve and, and giving her so much of her information. So is she supposed to be the serpent? Is that the thing that we're doing like an Adam and Eve and she's the serpent thing? Because that's all that really makes sense. But with Adam and Eve, it's like they were given actual knowledge and information. And it feels more like Claire or Claire, Claudia was just lying to them because she just wanted her daughter to survive. And so she told them whatever the fuck was going to work at that moment. And she altered it whenever she talked to either one of them at any other time. Again, just to make sure that whatever was likely to work was what they heard. And I, so this whole like claim about the two of them, it just, with, with the origin mixed in, I don't understand the meaning of it. I don't understand why it was necessary. It seems like they're trying to say the origin was working for Eve because of like their presence here with them. But what is being said when we see the origin, the, the like voice over here is um, again, still Claudia's like monologue as she's talking to Jonas. She's saying, you want to destroy your son and then not along with him. Eva wants him to live. Therefore, she must maintain the knot. She can't help it. She'll do anything she can to keep her son alive time and time again. Okay. I don't see it. There's no indication from what we have seen of Martha that being pregnant is anything but a fucking nightmare to her. And even Eve, who's like, you know, a grown woman now who could express some emotion and affection doesn't. There is no impression to me that Martha gives a fuck about this kid. I have no reason to think that, you know, all I can think is that it's a piece of Jonas and Jonas is dead and wanting to cling to it for that reason. But assigning her the motivation of just wanting to keep her kid alive feels vaguely misogynistic and super, super convenient in a way that, to me, isn't actually illustrated anywhere in their actions or dialogue. And as, like, as, again, the, the contrast between what Claudia is saying and what Martha is doing, she's being approached by the trio and is really deeply uncomfortable, clearly does not like this situation. And there's just this whole like vibe to it of horror of her, like looking at this, this tri triple being that seems sort of awful. They don't have this, like, they don't give off a vibe of a son that you'd be proud of. <laughs> you know, they give off a serial killer vibe. It's a very uncomfortable feeling. And the idea that she's like desperate to save them, just, I'm, I don't, uh, mm -mm, no, no, I don't think so. Then we have her being handed like the clothes that she has to change into and the gun in order to go and kill Jonas. And both of you have, again, Claudia, you've done unimaginable things on your journey because you can't let go of your deepest desire. Now, why, like, the de so is the deepest desire meant to be that she's, like, trying to kill Jonas to save her son in this moment? Because that's not... The the actual, like, in my opinion, the motivation in this scene when she kills Jonas is solely that she thinks that this is going to somehow stop Adam because he just wants to destroy everything. And she has been told, once again, her agency is, like, not there. And neither is Jonas's a lot of the time. They just perform actions based on what somebody told them to do. And... 
So this moment of her deciding to like go out there and pull the trigger being framed as if this is like her desperation to cling to something. We don't ever see her care about the thing she's evidently clinging to. It hasn't been a factor as far as I have seen. And even if it is a factor, it's not for this Martha. It's for a Martha farther up in the future. Maybe after she gives birth. I don't know. So it just doesn't work here at all. Ugh. Ugh. Okay. So we get to see this murder. Um, and then we go to the scene with uh, Claudia and um, Ulrich's dad, whose name I'm forgetting. I think it was like Bertrand or something. Um, and he is saying how he wishes that Re that Regina was his daughter. Or not even that he wishes, but that he had thought for a long time that he was the do the f father. And... Claudia says that she had wished he was for quite a while, but now she's glad to realize that because he isn't Regina's father, that means that Regina isn't part of the knot. And that means when she fixes it, Regina won't die. She won't disappear, which again, just really to me sort of, slams home the fact that Claudia doesn't give a fuck about anybody but Regina. She is the one who can't seem to let go. And I am, I don't entirely feel that motivation either. I've got to be honest. If Claudia was just power hungry and wanting to be the one who figured out the knot so that she could somehow make use of the information. I feel like that would be more on brand for me. But somewhere along the line, she saw her daughter suffering from her chemotherapy treatments. It all clicked that she had been a bad mom. And she grew obsessed with this concept of like fixing her mistake. And that's all well and good. I'm sure a lot of parents can relate to that sort of like struck by lightning moment of, wow, I really fucked up and I have to figure out what I can do to un undo it or mitigate the damage. But it did feel a little bit abrupt for me when it happened. This like, it's one thing to realize you fucked up and want to do better. It's another thing for everything that you begin to do to revolve around that now. And it, it, so we have two women characters motivated purely by their children. And then a male character who's apparently just motivated like by pain and suffering, who just wants it all to end. Okay. Um, so she, at this point tells him, uh, that he has to go and kill Regina. And I'm not, remembering what the reasoning is behind needing to do it. He said, she says like, you need to put her out of her suffering and her misery. But, uh, I feel like there's something more to the plan than that. And I don't think I'm seeing it. Um, so, all right. Uh, jumping forward here. There's so much to talk about. And yet there are so many things that I just don't really want to talk about because I'm feeling, I'm just feeling so salty. Again, Adam asks her, how do you know all of this? And she doesn't tell him. She just says, I was searching for the puzzle pieces, trying to fit how they were put together. She doesn't just explain to him, here are the things that I saw. Here are the indications and in that what I realized. Because eventually what she says is that at the moment of the apocalypse, there is a sort of like break in the timelines due to time standing still, literally for a moment. And because time isn't like moving forward for that fraction of an instant, that is 
when you can sort of like dig into your loopholes and make other things happen. How does she know that though? She keeps talking about putting puzzle pieces together, realizing what was going on with like, you know, um, uh, what's his face? Tan. <laughs> I keep wanting to say tan and Um, but I don't understand. She continues to say she had to make sure that both he and Eve were in the dark to keep everyone in this knot in the dark, which is, I guess what the reasoning is for the name of the show, which I've wondered a few times, everything had to happen the way it always has. In your world and in hers. Okay. Again. It just doesn't though. It happens because you make it happen. So you're not keeping people in the dark. You're moving them around like pieces on a board. Is that what you mean? If you're, are you just basically trying to say I had to do everything the way that I had? Because it just, it really, like, comes down to that, to me. It's all about her. This is the Claudia show, evidently. So, ah, okay. So, we see this, like, parallel situation where Ulrich, it winds up, like, does beat the shit out of Helga in the other universe, but Helga is older and drags his body into the uh, the bunker at the same time as we're watching the first murder or attempted murder, I should say, uh, older Helga comes out and bashes him in the back of the head with a uh, crowbar and then kills him. And when he does that, Claudia comes out. And it's like she's looking around, realizing something for a second. As she, she says in her monologue, this is overlaid in, like, over the scene where they're looking around at the carnage in this bunker. And she says, but I finally understand how to untie the knot. And I'm not entirely clear why this is the moment. It feels like something must have happened here in an instant that wasn't like the other times that she has seen, but I don't really like, this is the other version of him. And so I don't feel like I knew what went on. Is it just the fact that she didn't realize he had already like, did she think that the injury that Helga was like had on his face as an elderly man was also sustained as a child, like the first Helga and so she was surprised to walk in and realize that it happened when he was like a grown man and put together that things can be changed. Is that what it is? I don't know if I'm getting that right. Um, but, uh, okay. I'm just, I'm really wanting to like get, like go through everything that happens here, but I'm finding myself so like caught up on things that to me just feel really flat. Um, so then we go to the moment where Adam somehow fucking convinces Jonas to listen to him again in a scene that's just inexplicable. I just don't get it. Um, he instructs Jonas that he has to go and get Martha away before she leaves with, uh, with Magnus and um, Francesca. And Jonas agrees. Um we see the moment where he comes up on her and I actually, it's a pretty fun scene the way that it's done and how he like tackles her and they disappear as they're falling over. And finally she, he explains to Martha because like, there's a moment of her being like, Oh my God, you're alive. And then realizes that he doesn't actually know who she is. This isn't like the Jonas that she watched get shot coming back to himself somehow. This is the Jonas that like is from a different world who do who was dealing with the other Martha. So okay. Um he this is when he's explain says it's difficult to explain. It's not that difficult to explain. 
We have to get to them before they die. And again, this like, guys, I'm just fed up. Look, I'm sorry I'm being so negative, but I can't help it. This felt like just a culmination of all these things about the show that had been vaguely irritating me, just becoming more and more aggressively irritating than they've been so far. So this whole, like, I can't tell you, it's too complicated. We just have to do the thing. Just listen to me. It's one thing if you're having that dialogue be in a scene where people are like sprinting through the woods trying to get somewhere. But what this show does is have people uh, like allege there's no time and then stand staring at one another for like five full seconds in dead silence with this like poignant music. You could have been talking right then. It did not need to be like this. And I, as a viewer, have to sit here listening to myself breathe, waiting for somebody to fucking say something. All you have to do is say, we have to stop time travel from being invented. I'll tell you about it as we walk. No, it's a, it's, it's too complicated. He starts to walk away. She grabs his arm dramatically. He stops and turns to look at her. Pause. 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 What are you saying? Oh my god. <sighs> Finally. You, she realizes you want both of our worlds to end. Yes, that's what it comes down to. <laughs> Nina in the chat says that's German TV for you. Look, I have no problem with a slow moving scene. You know, like In the Mood for Love is one of my favorite movies of all time. And it is a slow movie. That's like part of what makes it good. But you can't have scenes this slow and have urgency in the dialogue and expect me to not notice how those don't match up. Like, come on. So yeah, this is when she has to make the decision because she, re she, you know, she gets a straight fucking answer out of him, out of him, and just to, like has to decide: Am I prepared to let our worlds end and me not exist anymore? And this is what's like. The two of them are just really such martyrs. Like, you couldn't pick two better people who have to sacrifice themselves. Because they're both just so willing to do that. It really feels like a relief. You know, it feels like the whole thing that Hannah says at the end of the episode, where there was darkness and it felt good. That's the kind of vibe that I get from the two of them, is more that they're sick of this shit. And if they have to die for a thing to happen, like, almost good. Uh, that's no problem. I really won't resist at all. So she has a moment of standing there being like, well, should I do this? And then she decides to follow him. And I just want to back it up again and remind everybody. We don't know if Claudia is right. Okay, so a couple episodes ago, we have the whole Schrodinger's cat thing with like two things can be true at the same time if you don't actually observe because it's in a state of being able to go either way. And the observation is what determines where it goes, right? But then there's this thing, this episode where Claudia just alleges that the time streams being created by this time travel machine are tumors. That's the word she uses. She's insinuating that they are like a sickness and anything that is born from them is equally sick. That's a wild allegation. Like, why do you feel like you have the right to make that judgment call? Yeah, d has time travel apparently caused some suffering? Absolutely. But you know what also causes suffering? Literally everything. So this, like, assertion we just undo time travel here in this one instant and fix it all, 
if we're going to go with the whole, like, people do what they do and stuff happens no matter what all the time, I guess what we're supposed to think is that Ten House isn't going to ever try to build this time machine because his son doesn't die. It's never going to be attempted because he's going to have, not only will he not have the motivation of desperately wanting his son back, but he won't have the time because he has an actual family to be with, right? It's not going to be lonely him with nothing else in his life and all of his focus goes 100% to this time machine. Now that said, (laughs) and I know this, this is not the point, but I just have to, okay? So just bear with me. He was able to like build a fucking actual time machine in a bunker with just like parts that he was able to purchase as a civilian somehow and assemble together himself. I'm going to assert that time travel seems like it's inevitable if he was able to figure it out with the tools that he had. So Claudia is being like, we just have to not make time travel be possible. Well, that hypothesis is predicated on the notion that he's the only one who could ever do this. And if you just stop him, that's it. And it's over and it never happens again. Maybe that's not even a concern of hers because whether somebody else figures it out has no effect on Regina, which is what we know is her fucking sole motivation. So if somebody else wants to mess up their town, in the United States or Australia or, you know, somewhere, then they can go ahead and do that. But she's like only trying to fuck with what messed Winden up. Okay, fine. But just reminder, when both Martha and Jonas, I was wanted to say Adam and Eve, but they're not, they're the younger ones. When they both decide to sacrifice themselves, they're also like willingly sacrificing a lot of other people. And yet it's really treated as only their sacrifice because these other people aren't aware that they are being sacrificed. And it doesn't feel like Jonas or Martha really gives them a lot of thought. Once we get to the end of the episode and we see who is left, you know, there's no, first of all, there's no Ulrich. Um, and I forget who who it is that um, Katharina is with. And Hannah is uh, with the guy whose eye was messed up and we never actually like wound up finding out what happened with his eye, which I actually found pretty funny. I kept thinking that it was going to turn out to be so significant and then it just seems to not have anything to do with anything. I don't know if there's a theory out there or if there's sort of an Easter egg explanation that I missed. Um but, you know, if they if there really is no explanation, I'm fine with that. And I find it kind of amusing. Um, so, OK, Ulrich doesn't exist. Uh, Charlotte doesn't exist. Noah and Agnes don't exist. Silva, Silva, Sylvie doesn't exist. Jonas and Martha don't exist. Who else? Mikkel and Magnus, Elizabeth. Like, we're talking two thirds of the town. At least the ones that we know are all gone. And it's not to say that they'll never be there because we have that moment at the very end where Hannah decides that she's going to name her son Jonas. So there may be a Jonas, but it's going to be a different thing. The fact, though, that she had that dream about darkness and then says she wants to name her kid Jonas feels like we're about to start another cycle again. Is that what we're doing? Is that do you guys think that that's like purposeful by the show to have her sort of be meditating on this like dream of the end of everything? And then she decides to name her child the same name as the person who in this alternate timeline was intent on destroying everything. Because if so, I'm into that. I like that idea that somehow Jonas always winds up being like a force for destruction. You know, that's kind of interesting. I just don't really like that. Martha and Jonas shoulder the blame for these two worlds being such a mess. Instead of Tenhouse. 
who's really the one who does the thing. And I, like when I say shoulder the blame, mostly that's Claudia. Just like really telling them they are the problem and they're the ones perpetuating everything. Again, she's saying they're the ones perpetuating everything, despite the fact that she is in every single fucking critical moment telling people where to go, what to do, what to say. So it's really rich to me that she has the unmitigated gall to like put the blame on them when she is the mix. She is the mix. They are the spoons. She's just spinning them and mixing the thing up. But she's like, you know, like, and they just buy it. They just go for it and listen to her. There's no reason to believe her. There's no reason for it. It's just... She even says to Adam, this timeline is the one where Regina can live. She, like, pretty much tells him, like, that's her real motivation. And he doesn't really seem to hear it or care or process what that means. I don't know. But when you get down to it, the issue is that Ten House couldn't let go. And what we do to avoid this, like, catastrophic mistake that he almost makes is we stop a tragic thing from happening to him. I guess it just, again, it's like these these other people all have to sacrifice or be sacrificed on behalf, like to keep this one guy happy so he doesn't make this big, terrible mistake. And again, it was a mistake. This wasn't what he was going for. And therefore, it could easily happen again. Right? Like, it just feels, you know, I don't know. There's just, it's so circular. Uh, okay, 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 okay. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get back to the thing. Uh, then there's a, a scene that if we just put everything else that I'm so frustrated with on the back burner, I did actually kind of like, which is Adam showing up and Martha basically, or Eve being like, you're going to kill me. I know you're going to kill me. I remember finding my own body. And she sort of like holds his hand up and tries to pull the trigger and nothing happens. And she looks over and realizes that he has all of the bullets in his hand and that this isn't going the way that it was initially supposed to go. And it's the first time that it hasn't gone this way. And she's really like shook by it. Um, as that that is happening, we have the uh, monologue from Claudia. Every pain tempts us to act forms our will. Tannhaus lost everything that ever meant anything to him in the origin world. And his son, his daughter-in-law, his granddaughter died in a car accident. They were forced off a bridge. And obviously this is meant to like, give us the clue of how we're going to stop this. And he could never let go of his pain. I, I really do want to ask again, how this had not occurred to Eve or Adam before now. It feels like this is the most obvious thing in the world. If they had known that this was his, this guy's deal, and I can't imagine that they didn't, this should have been attempted a while ago. Okay. So, eventually we have Martha and Jonas being like, they are, they go to the area that's right under the bunker when Tenhouse does his experiment that actually like winds up punching a hole through time. And they get brought into what's sort of this like bridge, time bridge. It's a neat bit. Um, I don't really understand the significance of seeing each other as children. I think it's just meant to show the like ways that time can overlap in a way that isn't just you travel into that world, but there you can catch a glimpse of it in a way, which is kind of a cool concept. And it would also explain ghosts pretty well. <laughs> Um, but 
the the two of them are split up and they each see one another as children and when they talk about it later they have the memory of seeing one another in these odd moments that they sort of wrote off as being dreams later on so then we have Jonas using the machine and jumping from that bridge area into Ten House's world. I thought it was a little weird because the bridge seems to be like it has doors. So I thought they would just walk like down the bridge and walk out the door to Ten House's world, but he still winds up having to use the time machine, which I wasn't really sure what, why that was necessary here. And we get to see a fight between Ten House and his son, who's like, his name is like, Marek, something like that. Um, and this dude is basically like yelling at his dad about how his father is like, eh, this is something that can really happen with people who are academics. They just like are constantly in their head and don't notice what's going on around them. And it can be really hard to deal with. And so apparently... His son has made it very clear, or so he thought, that he doesn't have any interest in taking over the store for, like after his father is gone. He has his own things that he wants to do. And his father is still acting like shocked by this. And his son is like, do you even hear me when I talk? I have told you so many times that this is not what I wanted. Um, and he says, no wonder mom couldn't stand it here. Your endless lecturing uh, has Sonia ever been asked if she's even interested in all these years? Have you ever asked if I'm interested or what I want? And his father gets distracted here because of the thunder and then just says it's raining outside. Wow. That's uh, really reaching out to your kid there, huh? In this moment of crisis, you know, like, did Ten House deserve his son to be saved? He seems kind of shit at this. I don't know. Not saying that his son deserved to die. But... <sighs> anyway, so they go out, storm off. They're in the driving in the rain. And Jonas and Martha appear in front of his car in order to distract him. And knock him off his course. And they do this thing where they just stand and stare at him with their arms at their sides and this blank expression that is frankly hilarious because there's no reason that you have to be this weird. Guys, you could just say, hey, dude, um, yeah, we're, we're actually waiting for somebody to pick us up. Uh, something happened on the bridge and it's closed now. And our car is stuck there. So we're walking back to get help. Just don't head in that direction. They could make up a perfectly like real world reasonable story to keep this guy from going that way. Instead, they stare at him for a long time saying nothing until Jonah says the bridge is closed in this fucking dead voice that would get me sprinting over the bridge to get away from him. And then Martha says, uh, oh, and then as like this guy starts walking away, he says, uh, it's a, it's an ocean and we know, but a drop, which is like the thing that his father always says. And that sort of is the signal. What we don't know is an ocean that this guy needs to pay attention and that there's something more going on here. So after he says that, Martha says, your father loves you. He would do anything for you. And he gets a bit freaked out here, gets back in the car and decides that he's going to head home after all. And when he goes and sees his dad, he tells him it wasn't like anything in particular happened. I just got this feeling. Um, his wife says, that he thinks that they were angels, which I'm not sure if she's just sort of teasing him or if he like said something like that to her. And I kind of like the idea that like angels are just time travelers who are just, you know, I can't remember what comedian it was, but they said something like, if you really want to fuck somebody's day off up, 
go up to them when they are in an airport and just give them a really serious look and shake your head solemnly and say, don't get on the plane and then walk away. And they will never be able to shake that for the rest of their lives. I was like, that is fucked up, dude. (laughs) So these two make up and apparently, you know, their relationship heals and that is enough to start the process of the other two worlds that got broken off from it to begin to dissolve. So we see both, uh, Jonas and Martha and Adam and Eve begin to disappear as what a wonderful world begins to play, which is a really questionable choice in my opinion, because like, is it, it it doesn't have time travel. So the other mess is like gone, but Katarina at the end, when they ask what you would wish for, she says a world without Winden, which to me implies things aren't great. I don't, I didn't expect that to still be somebody's like choice for a wish uh, at this point. But, you know, maybe it's just meant to be a joke, but everybody seems very enthusiastic when she says it. And they're like, here, here, yeah, toast, a world without Winden. And I was like, what's wrong? I thought this was supposed to be better. And, Yeah, we see also like middle age Jonas disappearing and uh, we eventually get to all of the like sort of family trees that are on the wall begin to vanish as Claudia looks down at herself and begins to vanish. And I couldn't like, I think that she expected herself to vanish. It doesn't seem like she's surprised by it, but I don't remember if that comes up, if she mentions that. Um. And she, who are her parents? It's uh, Egon and Doris. Was that her mother's name? Um, are they products of the, the not? I didn't really think Claudia would disappear, actually, I guess, when I stop and think about it. Egan, we do, do we see him as a child? I'm trying to remember. I know, you know, I remember seeing child Hannah. Um, and I don't remember child Doris. I don't remember child Egan. I'm not sure how they fit in to the whole not aspect. I mean, I'm sure that, the you know, they figured that out and that Claudia is part of it. I'm not trying to say they got this wrong, but I'm just trying to iron out in my head exactly how that worked. Um, so... Yeah, this is the uh, the dinner scene. Um, and it's, again, uh, Katerina, she, who is she sitting next to? Um, is she single, maybe? Because I feel like uh, we see that Peter is with Benny. And I was really pleased by that. There was something so sweet about the fact that that relationship, like, winds up working out because it just felt so fraught. And you know, Charlotte not being like inserted into his life artificially, I guess is what is supposed to have made that work out. But it is also interesting that like Regina doesn't have anybody and it looks like Katharina doesn't have anybody. I I wonder if that is just how it goes for them or what the whole thing with uh, this dude and his eye too. (laughs) I don't know how he winds up with Hannah. I sure hope that he treats her better than she winds up being treated by literally everybody on this show. She deserves something, you know, but, um, Regina is the one who I think owns the house that is Jonas's in the original version of the world, which is interesting. Um, I had forgotten about that, like palatial estate that Helga had lived on, when um, Ulrich came to kill him, this like, you know, it was huge. Whatever happened to that place? Because I thought, is Helga dead? Is Helga part of the knot? Does he vanish? Because he just, I don't feel like he like was born of it. 
He got involved in it, but that wasn't exactly his fault. And wasn't Peter his son? So he has to have existed for Peter to exist, right? And so maybe it's Peter's house now. Um, and I wonder if Katerina lives in the same place that she did. Just like, I like to sort of theorize about where everybody winds up if things don't go the way that they did. Because that house was the house that Ulrich had grown up in. And then they wound up, you know, owning it when they were married and had a family. Um, so I am going to assume she doesn't live there because he's not in her life and that whole, uh, that whole thing wouldn't have even happened. Um, all right. So the lights go out and we see this moment with Hannah having this like deja vu. And then she tells everybody about the dream that she had. And they sort of like laugh because it's pretty like bleak and dark, honestly, not really great. Like, dinner party conversation and they ask her whether she has picked out a name yet because she says that maybe the dream and the deja vu were due to pregnancy hormones and she says she doesn't know and then ends it with i always thought jonas was a good name but she has this really serious face when she says it and that's the end of the episode and it's like there's no need in a regular like dinner party with friends to be so uh, like intense when you're just telling them the name that you've picked out. She's looking like she's delivering a death sentence when she says it, which is part of why I took it as maybe like the cycle does continue after all. Like maybe that's what they're trying to say. Um, if reincarn like, I guess it wouldn't be reincarnation because he had never actually lived. Um, but I don't know. I just, I understand the like vague idea that the worlds that become split from the moment that he uses the machine weren't supposed to be there. But like, why do you get to decide what's supposed to have been and what's not? You're just trying to like, you just feel like, well, my daughter's suffering and she shouldn't have to. And this is wrong. So uh, obviously these whole worlds and all the people in them shouldn't exist. That's a pretty fucking bold stance to take. You know, like just because of your tiny little f like fraction of a fraction corner of the universe isn't going the way that you like. You just decide that this whole timeline just needs to be done away with. Well, damn. Like, <laughs> I just really want to know why we're taking Claudia's word for fucking anything. There is nothing that indicates to me she gives a shit about the truth. It doesn't feel like she ever has. It's just sort of, I don't know. So I feel like I've talked about pretty much all I can. I'm over time anyway. But guys, I'm just so damn pissed off. I really feel like this show just sort of just started to get really repetitive and they kept making these big reveals, but they wind up not really meaning very much. And everybody's just fucking monologuing all the time. And it, 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 they're not really saying anything when they do. And they're all so tragic and all so committed to sacrificing even when it's hard or allowing terrible things to happen because that's what we must be done. And it's just tiresome. And there was nobody that I was like really on their side by the end. And I didn't even really care about anyone enough. To, but like, you know, by the time this all wraps up, Katarina and Hannah and Peter, they're all dead. And they were some of the people that I actually like found interesting. The whole thing with Ulrich was just super sad. And... I, I don't know if maybe we're supposed to be seeing this like world where the knot doesn't exist, that Hannah and Peter and Katharina are all alive and that's meant to be proof that this world is better. But how can you know that? Like, you, that's all these people exist and those other people don't. That's that's basically inherently saying, well, those other people were bad people who made the world worse. That's not fair or necessarily true. It's a odd stance to take, frankly. I don't know. I just, I wanted something out of this that I just didn't get. And there's a feeling like the show has forgotten 
the way they set uh, Claudia up from the beginning to be the one to tell Adam everything. So that when she like comes at him and is just like, hi, you idiot, you were trying to do this. Yeah, you were the one who fucking told him to do that. And you admit that you were lying to him. Why are you mad that he internalized the thing that you promised? Like, that's you. You're an asshole. Why? That's not his fault. Uh, Ms. T says, no Armageddon. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I mean, yeah. But again, that's not like, that was never her concern. Claudia didn't care about the apocalypse. It never felt like that was some, she's like purely about whether Regina lives and not even Regina doesn't get killed because of the apocalypse. It's not even like I need to stop the apocalypse to save my daughter. She gets cancer, you know? So like, and the, of course, alleged correlation there is because of the nuclear power plant. I'm certain, but never like the, the nuclear power plant, I don't think even exists. Right in the new version of the world. If it does, there's still a possibility, I guess that Regina gets cancer, but I don't think it does. Um, it just, it, it, I don't really know why the split offs had to result in Armageddon. Like th again, th we got Armageddon both times, but Claudia had her hand in every single thing that happened and everybody was insisting we have to ensure things go the same way. Where, why? Y'all are operating on some theories that don't really feel like they are actually founded in anything. I, I think that's what's missing for me is I expected by the end to like, for them, some of the rules that have been established that I trusted, I expected to find out what the basis was for them that there was a real reason why everybody was so certain things had to be done this way. And we don't really get that. It's just somebody told me so. And that person turned out to be a liar multiple times, but I still believe this one thing. Why? I just feel like there were probably a number of ways we could have avoided Armageddon. If we didn't do the same things over and over, if we didn't put people in place to interfere at exactly certain points and make sure things happen the same way. Like you are actively trying to cause Armageddon if you're con like making certain everything goes the way that it did. So the, the fact that Armageddon doesn't happen in this like final world feels purely circumstantial and not like it was the goal at all. You know, I don't know. I don't like it and I'm pissed and I feel very let down and it's just, I don't know. I wanted there to be like, some sort of reveal that somebody knew what was going on. And it really felt like that wasn't it. We just, again, had to like trust somebody because they, they're finally saying, no, this time I'm telling you the truth. And this whole show, it's been nothing but people saying that from season one and then turning out to be full of shit. So forgive me if I've gotten to a point where I don't hear the words that anybody is saying as truth anymore. You guys made me jaded and now I don't trust you. I don't know what you want from me. Um, so, I will say I'm really relieved to have been able to like get to the finale because there would have been so much buildup if I had to wait to cover this that I think I might have been even more angry by the time I got to it if it had, if I'd had to wait weeks. So thank you very much to Bert for commissioning this and allowing me to move it up. I'm sorry if uh, you loved the finale and you do not agree with anything I said. I can't help the fact that you're very wrong, but I guess you can learn to live with it. And you know, let me know what you think, because I am curious if you liked it, like why? Because I cannot find a thing to like, really can't. Like the only thing be being that Martha and Jonas get to escape the cycle of like terrible suffering, which good for them. Would that we all could. Honestly, maybe they all got off easier, the ones who disappeared. All right, guys. Thank you for listening. Sorry about this. Toodaloo, motherfuckers.
an unspoiled network podcast.